All right, this video is meant to be an overview to bacterial genetics. Um, as far as bacterial genetics go, for those of you who are entering med school, there isn't that much that you actually have to know about it. Um, I went through this particular um, this particular uh, section looking through the step one guide and just kind of pulling out the concepts that I thought that were important that I thought you should have kind of some familiarization with um, and some understanding of what the words are and what they mean. Um, but you don't need to go very in depth here. So just kind of a once over so that when I say things like bacteriophage, you know what that means. Um, so let's kind of just start with the basics of it. Um, genetically, bacteria typically only have one copy of their chromosomes. Uh, and they only have one chromosome. Um, it carries the entirety of the bacterium's genetic identity. It's, you know, a full, that's it. Um, so what makes that interesting, particularly from like an antibiotic resistance standpoint, is that if you have a singular mutation in that chromosome, that's the whole show. Um, it's not like there's a second chromosome that can repress that mutation like in us or um, affect how it's inherited. Like, no, that antibiotic resistance mutation is now there and will be replicated over and over and over again. So it's going to have a more obvious and direct and faster effect than in a multi-cell diploid organism such as ourselves. Um, this makes bacteria more adaptable. So one cell that has gained a mutation may survive and quickly repopulate the entire um, population as opposed to the ones that do not have the advantage of that mutation. Um, so the bacterial chromosome contains protein structures, which are known as cistrons. Um, so cistrons um, are basically genes for ribosomal and transfer RNA. And when a bacteria divides, one membrane associated chromosome partitions into each daughter cell. Um, so if we've, here's our thing. It does uh, a replication event and it's bound to the membrane. And then we split into two daughter cells that each have a copy of the chromosome. Um, bacterial genes are grouped into operons. That's another key word you should keep in mind. Operons are basically islands. That's it, okay? And these islands share a function. Um, and in pathogenic organisms, they are typically referred to as pathogenicity islands. Um, as these genes where these islands are found share a function. Um, and that's normally not good for us and is very good for the organism. Okay, so when we think about genetics in a bacteria, we've got kind of three sources for where genetic material might come from. So the first is that chromosome that I was just talking about. Um, it is a haploid genome with only one complete set of genes. It's typically a singular, circular, double-stranded DNA molecule. And replication um, takes place in both directions to kind of speed up the process um, sympathetically. Okay, the other option is a plasmid. Plasmids are extra chrom chromosomal. Um, they're autonomous, they're self-replicating genetic elements. They're not really essential for the bacterial viability. Um, they're smaller than the actual chromosome itself. They can vary in size. Um, and they basically, plasmids tend to be what contains the part of the bacterium that's going to cause us trouble. So um, you'll have plasmids that have toxins or virulence factors um, that basically promote their colonization through adherence or resistance. Um, that's where we see a lot of um, the antibiotic resistance mutations are on these plasmids that are kind of shared across bacteria um, and functions that promote DNA transfer from one cell to the other. Um, plasmids that are able to promote the transmission of DNA from one bacterium to another bacterium, they encode for something known as a sex pili, um, and they are referred to as conjugative plasmids. 
Okay, the third one is bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are basically bacterial viruses. So a virus is an obligate intracellular parasite. It relies on the machinery of another cell, eukaryotic, or in this case, prokaryotic, to replicate itself. Um, bacteriophages are involved in the process of something called transduction, which we'll talk about a lot in a little bit. But transduction is basically a mechanism that bacteria use to transfer genetic information. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are um, enzymes of the bacteria that will degrade DNA that has a different methylation pattern than the bacterial DNA. Um, this is actually an example, a very early example of a bacterial immune system. So just like in our own immune systems, we have ways for detecting um, methylated or uh, CPG DNA, which is bacterial DNA. Bacteria have a way of detecting foreign DNA and breaking them up. So it allows the genetic material within a phage to be broken up. And then when the phage gets broken up, some of that genetic material might be incorporated into the bacterial chromosome, into the bacterial genome. Um, so these restriction enzymes can actually play a role in how these bacteriophages are incorporated into the overall genetic material for a bacterium. All right, so on the last slide, I mentioned numerous times that we have ways of transferring genetic material between cells, okay? So I, I wanna kind of draw this out very clearly. So if this is bacterium A, and it has this green chromosome, and this is bacterium B that has this blue chromosome, there are ways, and we're gonna talk about some of them, whereby some of bacteria A's genetic material winds up in bacterium B, okay, and kind of gets spliced in to the chromosome and then expressed. And now B is kind of this new form of the bacteria that has, is mostly B, but has a little bit of A in it. Um, so the first method for uh, mechanisms of genetic material transfer between the cells that we're going to talk about is transformation. Transformation is the active uptake of um, genetic material, um, so exogenous or foreign DNA, okay? So transformation allows bacteria to take up naked DNA from a cell that was lysed, okay? Um, one strand of the DNA, because remember, it's, we've got a singular chromosome, but it likely has two strands, right? So we've got one DNA helix, but it's just one chromosome. So one strand is degraded, and the other strand enters the new bacterial cell. Um, what happens then, so here's that free DNA from a dead cell. It get, gets picked up, and then it undergoes this process known as homologous recombination. This occurs where a short linear piece, like we're showing here, of DNA is incorporated into the bacterial chromosome. There's a one-to-one -one exchange of the DNA. No DNA is lost, and it can be used to combine circular pieces of DNA, like plasmids, phages, transposons, and bacterial chromosomes. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about something known as recombination frequency here frequency here. This is the thought that the closer two genes are on the chromosome, the more likely they are to be co-transmitted in a random fragment of DNA. So if we have a, let's say, if I'm looking at this bacterial chromosome and I break it into five pieces, all right, so one, two, three, four, five, all right? And this is strand one, two, three, four, five. So these pieces correlate to these pieces, all right? If I have a gene, if I have two genes that are both found on strand one, and this is strand one, it is more likely that both of these genes are gonna get incorporated via homologous recombination than say a gene that's on strand, this piece one and a gene that's on this piece four, okay? Um, so the closer two genes are, the more likely they are to be co-transmitted in a random fragment. 
All right, so that's all we're going to say about transformation. Now let's talk about conjugation. Um, this is sometimes referred to as bacterial sex because it's not, it's kind of how they go about doing this. So this is the mating of two separate bacteria. One acts as the donor and the other acts as the recipient. And this is a direct bacterium to bacterium plasmid transfer using what's known as the sex pillus in gram negative organisms. So that's something to keep in mind that this structure is largely found in gram negative organisms. Okay, so the donor bacterium over here contains what's known as the F plus plasmid. That means it has the sex pillus plasmid. The recipient bacterium is referred to as the F minus. Um, it is the organism that will receive the plasmid across the conjugation pillus or the conjugal bridge. Um, in this case, basically you have the donor cell attaches to a recipient cell with its pillus and the pillus draws the cells together. The cells then have very close contact to one another and one strand of the plasmid passes from the donor F plus bacterium to the recipient F minus recipient. Now, the recipient synthesizes a complementary strand and it's now an F plus bacterium. Okay, so we took an F minus and made it F plus because it was given. The original F plus bacterium still has it because we only removed one copy of it. Um, and that has a complete plasmid now. Um, here I wanna mention just the concept of high frequency recombination. Um, sometimes you'll see it written like this, HFR. This occurs if the F plasmid integrates into the donor bacterium's chromosome. So instead of having this plasmid out here, kind of extra chromosomally, if the plasmid actually went into the actual chromosome. But, because in that case, it's always going to be replicated, right? Um, during conjugation, the bacterial genome adjacent to the integrated plasmid, plasmid is transferred to the recipient. So that's just something to keep in mind. There's another way we can get genetic material directly into the chromosome. Okay, the last method we're gonna talk about is transduction. This is the transfer of genetic information from one bacterium to another by a bacteriophage. So this is particularly where we're talking about those um, bacterial viruses. Um, so you've got kind of two methods for doing this. You can have generalized transduction or you can have specialized transduction. I know this is really, really specific. So during generalized transduction, um, during replication, a rare bacteriophage may package a piece of host DNA. The bacteriophage injects into a recipient bacterial cell. Homologous recombination occurs, basically replacing the homologous genes in the recipient cell. In specialized transduction, this occurs during excision from the host chromosome. So when the phage takes an adjacent gene with it and then brings it to a new bacteria, okay? So one is just homologous recombination during a normal um, kind of replication event. The other is I'm gonna take an extra piece from the host chromosome during an excision event. Um, so this is kind of the process by which this happens. So the process is very similar to viral replication that you might see in a different video. So basically the phage is going to absorb to the specific cellular receptors, just like it would on our cells. Okay. And it's going to inject its DNA. Then you've got this phage DNA and it's going to go through a normal replicative process for basically viral DNA, early mRNAs, early proteins. And then once it's replicated its DNA, the structural proteins are made, and it's going to basically start making new virions, new viruses. In the meantime, some of this genetic material might get left in the cell. So that would be that generalized transduction. If it contained extra material, then that would be that specialized transduction. But either way, we're leaving this genetic material in this initial 
pool. Um, and if the bacterium lysed, we would release more phages and the life cycle would start again. When we think about bacteriophages, we can think of it in two ways. Bacteriophages can be either lytic or lysogenic. Um, and this is actually a fairly good comparison, again, to viruses, where we can have lytic viruses or we can have viruses that kind of remain stable or latent for years at a time. So a lytic phage, bacteriophages that infect bacterial cells and then replicate, rapidly producing new phage proteins and assembling new bacteriophages. Um, this process causes bacterial cells to lyse, releasing more and more bacteriophages into the environment. The lysogenic bacteriophage infects the bacterial cell and then integrates into the bacterial genome without killing the bacterial cell. Um, so much like a latent viral infection. All right, I wanna say something quick about mutations and then we'll actually table this conversation until we talk more about antibiotic resistance. The first thing you need to keep in mind about mutations is that they are random and they occur before selection. So what does that mean? If I have a blood auger plate, all right, and I am trying to grow Staph aureus on it, that's gonna grow just fine, all right? Now, let's say this particular colony of Staph aureus managed to mutate in such a way that if it was exposed to methicillin, it would still be able to grow while the rest would die. Then I plate all of these on another blood auger plate that now contains, let's say, methicillin, okay? In that case, only the colony that had the methicillin resistance mutation would survive. It's not the presence necessarily of the methicillin that induced it. The mutation was made possibly because it was able to survive, but we only saw it once we exposed it to that. So they're random and they occur before selection. We can increase the mutation frequency, frequency in a couple of ways. First off, UV light. Um, your mom's probably always telling you to put on sunscreen. Why? Because the sun has UV light and it induces mutations in us and bacteria all over the place. So we have dimers of adjacent nucleotides form, which are thymine dimers. And basically it introduces mistakes during the repair process. There's also ionizing radiation. This leads to single strand DNA breaks. And then lastly, we have chemicals that can induce point or specific mutations. There's actually something called the Ames test, which is a biological assay to assess the mutagenic potential of chemical compounds. Um, and bacteria are used to test whether a given chemical can cause mutations in the DNA of the test organism in this test. And we'll talk more about mutations when we talk about antibiotics. 